Welcome to Bokeh Canyon Church Online. We see our online service as an opportunity to be the church in a new way and extend our purpose to see everyone awaken to the love of God, growing in the love of God, and living out the love of God. On Sundays, Bokeh Canyon Church gathers together here in the Santa Clarita Valley and beyond to take part in worship, a message, and community. Bokeh Canyon Church is a place of hope where we connect with Jesus and each other. So don't forget to share our online service with friends and family. Let them know you're at church and you would like them to join you because we are better together. For more information about being a part of Bokeh Canyon Church, go to our website, bokehcanyonchurch.com for meeting times, upcoming events, past sermons, sermon notes, and giving. At BokehCanyonChurch.com, you can also let us know how we can be praying for you or how we can help with physical needs or assistance. Just fill out the communication card easily found by clicking on the Connect tab. We are so excited you have joined us this Sunday. Now let's join together to worship our Heavenly Father. Well, welcome. I'm Pastor David Beaver, and uh, welcome to Bokeh Canyon Church. If this is your first time with us today, I'm so happy that you chose to join us. Um, if you want to uh, interact and say hi, usually this time at church, we would always say, hey, greet one another and take some time to greet one another. You can do that on our church online platform and just go to our website, bokehcanyonchurch.com, click on the interactive tab, and there it takes you right to the church service and you can comment and say hello and welcome your friends to church and let them know how much you miss them. You can also find our um, tithing, uh, the giving tab up in the upper right hand corner. There's a prayer tab at the bottom. Did you click on that hyperlink? It takes you to a prayer request card and that leads us to our next announcement. Our next announcement is Monday morning prayer, tomorrow morning right out here on the patio. We will meet out here and we will bring up the prayer request to the Lord. We will bring our country to the Lord. We'll bring this election to the Lord. We will bring the world to the Lord in prayer and just ask for his blessings to overflow upon in this great country. Um, the other announcement I have is Operation Christmas Christmas Child. Let me try that again. Operation Christmas Child. That is the shoebox ministry. That is where you take a shoebox home and you fill it up with goodies and then that is sent all over the world and they are get into the hands of young people that don't have um, Christmas presents usually. And it's just a great outreach that uh, Samaritan's Purse does and we join with them in that. You can pick up the boxes anytime, Monday through Friday, excuse me, in the church office, and um, I'll be here, and I can hand you a box, and they are due back on November 21st at our Thanksgiving feast. Um, that leads us to the last announcement. Our Thanksgiving feast is November 21st, and it'll be right out here on the patio also, and we will join at 4 o'clock in the evening. Bring your own food. Bring, uh, you know, let's say a bucket of chicken from Cut Kentucky Fried or Pioneer or wherever you want. Bring that food and we'll sit out on the patio. We'll enjoy some great worship. We'll enjoy some great and fun talent and just being together. We can't have the normal Thanksgiving feast like we've done in the past where it's a big potluck because of this pandemic, but we can still enjoy each other's company. We can still laugh and have a great time. So join us on November 21st for our Thanksgiving feast. Also, that's when you bring back, that's the last day we will take those boxes for the shoe box or Operation Christmas Child. November 21st is the last day we'll take those boxes back. After that, the trucks leave and they, they're gone and there's no more taking them. So that's all I have for announcements. Thank you, God bless, have a great day, bye-bye. Well, thank you, Pastor David, and welcome to all of you again to Boca Canyon Church this morning. We are glad that you're with us, and what an important time to gather in worship when it seems like so much is in turmoil, so much battling, confusion, and, and all of this. And we've got various factions, different sides, and, and sometimes we can be saying, God, are you on our side? Are you on our side? And it reminds me of in the book of Joshua, Joshua encountered an angel. He didn't know it was an angel, but he said, are you on our side or are you on our enemy's side? And, and he said, as the commander of the Lord's armies, I have now come and Joshua fell on his face. And he realized it's not a question of whether he's on 
our side or the enemy's side. It's am I on his side? Am I on God's side? And and that's what we need to be thinking about. Uh, God has purposes we cannot see. Whatever ends up happening in this nation, we need to look to him. And the first song we're going to start with this morning is called Here for You. And we're saying, God, we are here for you. It's not you here for us. Uh, we're here to worship you. We're here to thank you for all you've done. And we're going to praise you with all our hearts. So let's prepare our hearts right now. Let's pray as we get ready to worship. Father in heaven, we are here for you. Because you, you were first here for us. You loved us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. We thank you, Lord. And we, we turn our attention to you. And we ask right now that your Holy Spirit would begin to work in our hearts, push all distractions aside, and, and that we would be drawn into worship and that it would be a pure worship full of faith and adoration, Lord, because you are worthy of it. We give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and sing to him. Good morning, Moke Canyon Church. Thank you for joining us. I just want to invite God into our hearts, into our homes. Um, so Lord, we just lift you up in praise. We thank you that we can go before you freely and worship you. Let's sing out.
This next song we're going to introduce is a song that's very special to me because um, I actually wrote this song um, kind of midway through the quarantine. I had nothing to do <laughs> and God just put on my heart to write some music and this is one of the songs that came out of it and it's just a song, <clears throat> I called it Worthy and um, it came out of reading about this passage in Revelations where all the angels are praising God, saying, holy, 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 worthy of all praise. And so this is a song of adoration um, to God and praise. So if you'll join me.
God that knew me before birth The same God who saw my every sin Sacrificed his son so I could be with him. The same God who formed the universe. The same God that knew me before birth. Amen, God. We will worship you with all that is in us, God, with our whole hearts. Despite everything in the world that seems chaotic, Lord, you are stable. You are a rock, a fortress. And we're standing in this fight with you, God. And we thank you that you are holy, that you are worthy, and that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are the Lord of all. And we thank you, God. We can't wait to be with you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Holy, holy is our God, worthy, worthy of all praise. That is so true. And that's why we're here to give him the honor that he is due. Uh, praise God. Well, before we turn to God's word this morning, I want to take a moment and pause and recognize that this coming Wednesday, November 11th, is Veterans Day. And we have a number of people in our church and maybe others of you uh, who, have been vet who are veterans might tune in and see this video at some point. We want to thank you. We want to honor you for your sacrifice. And uh, we can never know all the costs involved in in your service but thank you so much and even as this country is going through so much uh, we should be reminded that it's worth fighting for this country is special god has done some great things here and for those who have put themselves in harm's way thank you so much and we want to show a video um, just to call attention to your sacrifice and to say thank you. Let's all watch this.
Thank you once again, veterans. God bless you. God bless your families. And we do pray that God would bless the United States of America. Now we're going to turn to scripture this morning. We will start in Genesis chapter 46, or at least we'll spend most of our time there. We will start with actually a, a different scripture, but we'll get to that in a minute. Little review, we have been looking at the story of Joseph in Egypt. His brothers had sold him into slavery there uh, because they hated him, but God had a plan in the whole thing. And Joseph got raised up eventually to second in command of all of Egypt. And God used him to shine the, the light of truth of who the true God is to Pharaoh and his officials. And also he had, Joseph was given the wisdom to help save not only Egypt in a severe famine, but all the surrounding nations. And it's an amazing story. And we've seen how Joseph then had a reconciliation with his brothers. And now Jacob, Joseph's father, has been summoned. And the whole family is moving from Canaan to Egypt. And I said last week that that was going to be the last in the series of end time essentials that last week's message would be but i realized there's one more end time essential so we're going to look at end time essentials one more time today we're going to look at the essential of longing for our true home we live on the earth we walk on the earth but this is not our true home our true home is in heaven and while we have a purpose here our hearts belong and, and should belong to heaven. And it is appropriate that we would look forward to the Lord's return to being with him. So today's message is longing for home. End time essentials, longing for home. It has been said that home is where the heart is. And that is so true. I don't know if you've ever experienced homesickness, but very powerful emotion. Most people have experienced that at some point or another. And from Dorothy clicking her heels and saying there's no place like home to even aliens like E.T. trying to phone home so they can get back there. Uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder said, home is the nicest word there is. There's something so special about home, a place to belong. And in these days that we are living in, we should have that kind of longing for our true home. And so we're going to begin reading in 2 Timothy 4 verse 7. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy and he says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I want to pause and pray as we get into this message. Lord God, we pray that you would bless this time, open the eyes of our hearts, that we could see and understand what your word is saying to us today, God. We continue to pray for our nation. We pray for peace. We pray for unity. We pray that you would put a stop to the plans of the enemy, to tear us apart and to, to bring violence and, and civil war, Lord, we pray uh, that none of those ideas would take root here at all and, and that you would work in our land. We do pray that you bless the rest of this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, the first point here in talking about longing for home is looking forward to heaven looking forward to heaven. And Paul told Timothy in this passage we just read that Christians, among other things, are, are people who long for Christ's appearing. Why would that be? Well, there are a lot of reasons why we would long for his appearing. He is our hope. It says in 2 Timothy 2.13, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He's also our Savior. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. He rescues us. He's our Savior. Also Hebrews 9.28 So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Are you waiting for him? He, he is bringing salvation when he comes. 
He will give us new bodies that won't experience pain, age, or death. 2 Corinthians 5.2 says, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, that we're going to get new bodies that won't wear out or experience pain. Heaven, we're told, will be amazing beyond our imaginations. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even begin to fathom how great heaven is going to be for those who love God. We are told that in heaven there will be no more crying or pain or death. Everything will be made new. And so at the very end of the Bible... It says, the spirit and the bride, which is the church, the spirit and the bride say, come to the Lord Jesus. Come, Lord. We are longing for you to return. We want you to come back. And that is what I would call an end time essential, this longing for him to come. And Jesus says he will. And he says he will come soon. Revelation 22, verse 20 says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. And Here's our response to that. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Yes, God, do it. Yes, Jesus, come. We're longing for you. There should be a longing in us for that day. But there is another reason, in addition to the ones I've mentioned, that we should be looking forward to heaven. Yes, heaven will be wonderful. No more sickness, no more sorrow, no more death. But for the Christian, I think the greatest reason that we should be looking forward to heaven is that it is home. We don't really belong here on earth. We're strangers here. And I quote pretty often, I love the quote from C.S. Lewis, says, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical expla explanation is that I was made for another world. This world doesn't have what we're really thirsting for. It's because we're made for another world. We weren't made for this place. There's something better. And I imagine, and if you would imagine with me an orphan, in an orphanage, waiting to be adopted by someone, waiting to have a home, and looking forward to having a family and sitting around the dinner table and, and belonging somewhere, to be loved, to have a place to belong forever. When someone puts their faith in Christ, they are adopted into his family. And it's all about belonging to him. It's all about being in relationship with him. It says in Romans 8, 15 and 16, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you should live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is a, a word for dad. Daddy, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So once you have put your faith in Christ, you're adopted into that family. But on this earth, the full hum homecoming has not happened yet. Romans 8, 23, just a few verses later, says, Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we, eager, as we wait eagerly, for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So we've been adopted, but we have not arrived at our true destination, our true home yet. And what do we know about that home? Jesus in John 14, 2 says, My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. That is what heaven is all about. It's about being where he is. So just as Daniel prayed every day in a foreign land with his windows open toward Jerusalem, there should be a big part of us that is praying with our windows open toward the new Jerusalem the wedding supper of the Lamb, the abolishment of all evil, a new heavens and a new earth 
experiencing the presence, beauty, and holiness of our God forever. There should be a longing for home. In the meantime, we are foreigners here. Just like Jacob and all the Hebrew patriarchs were strangers in foreign lands. They've been given promises of a heavenly city awaiting them. And it says this in Hebrews eleven thirteen: These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, I just read that in the good old King James Bible. And I read it in that translation because it uses the word pilgrim. And if you are not aware, this month is the 400th anniversary of the pilgrims coming across on the Mayflower and landing in New England, uh, first at Cape Cod. And it's a little ironic that they, they used the King James Bible because it was from King James that they were fleeing so they could have uh, religious liberty and even though King James was a Protestant, as were the pilgrims, the pilgrims did not have freedom of religion. They could not worship the way they wanted. And, and they were just longing for a place to be. And I'm going to be spending some time, you know, this month talking a bit about the pilgrims. I've been reading a lot uh, about them. And they're our, they're our history. They're our heritage in a lot of ways. And I've been learning a lot of great things from original sources like William Bradford's journal. It's, it's really amazing. Now, I want to say this, that you've probably noticed around town, merchants everywhere have skipped ahead to Christmas. <laughs> and I've known for a while that with this COVID thing going on, everyone's going to be like, we are not missing out on Christmas. This is going to be a great Christmas. But I would say, let's not skip Thanksgiving. <laughs> let's not get ahead of ourselves especially because it's the 400 year anniversary of the pilgrims arriving and then next year in 2021 will be the 400 anniversary of the first thanksgiving that they celebrated here but back to this word pilgrim why were they called pilgrims and and it's because of that translation in the king james bible that i read to you here's a quote from william bradford's journal he was about 30 years old when he came across on the Mayflower, and he later became governor, served a number of terms as governor in the Plymouth colony. But he wrote this as they were getting ready to come across, but they knew they were pilgrims and lifted up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. Now, what, why did he use the word pilgrim? Pilgrim means a stranger, a traveler, a wanderer, especially in a foreign place. And he used that word alluding to Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, which I just read for you, which talked about the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who were strangers, pilgrims on the earth. But they were looking forward to a heavenly city that was promised. William Bradford said, this group. And you know what? That group, it was a church. It was a, a, a church of people. They've been a church family for years and they felt God calling them to relocate in America. And, and they saw themselves as pilgrims like Jacob had been, like Abraham had been. They, they were strangers on the earth. But what does William Bradford say? They knew they were pilgrims and lifted up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country. Okay, so that, that is what we should be doing. Looking forward to heaven, saying we're pilgrims here. This, we're just passing through. Our true country is heaven. As we walk this earth, we're longing for Christ appearing. And again, the biggest reason to do that is that where God is, that is heaven. That's where Christ is. But here's the thing. We also get a foretaste of that here on earth. His presence by the Holy Spirit. And that brings us to the next point. Loving God's presence, wherever that is. We get a constant taste of heaven by being in relationship with Christ now through the Holy Spirit. And that means that while heaven is our true final home, in the meantime, everywhere we go is home if we have God in our lives. Because home for the Christian is where God's presence is. Um, I've never, when I first got married, I didn't know about decorative pillows. 
and uh, Denise likes decorative pillows and they made no sense to me because we're not using them to 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 lay our heads on is it's just decorations they take up almost half the bed and they're in our way we got to do all this extra work I've gotten used to the decorative pillows and Denise just bought a new one just recently and I hadn't really paid attention to words that were written on it but as I was working on this sermon I happened to look at it and and it talks about where our home really is and here's a picture of that that pillow and this is true with God that home is wherever he is so let's get back to the story of Jacob Genesis 46 verse 1 it says so Israel that's Jacob set out with all that was his and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Now he's on his way to Egypt. He's on his way to a foreign land where he doesn't know the language or the customs. Again, he's going to be a foreigner, a pilgrim. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you. And I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Now, notice God says to Jacob, I will go down to Egypt with you. You know what that meant? That meant that Egypt would be home. Because that's where God was going to be. Wherever Jacob went, the presence of God is with us. It's not a physical location. It wasn't Bethel that Jacob had discovered earlier and thought he'd found the house of God because he had a, an experience with God there. It's wherever we go. The people of God, we experience his presence. And so that is a temporary home on our way to our true home. Genesis 17, 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. You know, there's this sense that Abraham's going to do a lot of walking. And he's going to be a stranger in foreign lands. Down in verse 8, God says, The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession. He's going to be a foreigner. He's going to be a stranger, as was Isaac, as was Jacob. But notice what it says. It says, Walk before me. And that shows relationship. But the, the, the word before, before me, in Hebrew is panim, and it can be translated face or presence. Face or presence. It's, it's, God says, Abraham, walk in my presence. Wherever you go, you're a stranger on earth, but you're in my presence, so you're home. You say, well, isn't God everywhere? Well, yes, that's true. So then aren't we always in God's presence? Yes, but not completely, because Two people can be in the same room and not be in each other's presence if their faces aren't turned toward each other, if they're ignoring each other, if they have a broken relationship or they're just distracted. And so we in our relationship with God to live in his presence is to seek his face, to pursue him, turn our attention to him. And that's home. That is home for us. We are pilgrims, wanderers. But we find home in him in his word, in worship. It says in Psalm 119, verse 54, your decrees are the theme of my song wherever I lodge, wherever I go, wherever I sleep, wherever I travel, your decrees are the theme of my song. I love you, God. Now, not only do we experience his presence on earth, but we are to be all about helping others experience his presence. And that brings us to the next point, bringing heaven to earth, bringing heaven to earth. In the Lord's prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come. So, okay, that's interesting. It's not just about us going to heaven. It's about bringing heaven, the kingdom of heaven here. Now, that has to do with the presence of, of God's reign meaning his rulership as a king in each person's heart, his, the influence of his kingdom. And it's not a political kingdom, but one that exists as the presence of Jesus. He says this in Luke 17, 20. It says, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, 
The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. You can't see it. It's not a government on earth in, in the way we're used to. Nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Well, the Pharisees didn't see the kingdom of God in their midst, but Jesus was standing right there. He was the king. You know what a king needs? It needs a king. To, uh, uh, you know what a kingdom needs? It needs a king. And it needs people who follow that king, who serve that king. And every heart that surrenders to that king, the kingdom of God just came to that life. God's kingdom is in the hearts of those who put their faith in the king and have invited him into their lives. And that kingdom is growing and will continue to grow on earth. Jesus says in Matthew 13, 31, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. The kingdom of God starts slow, but it's growing, it's growing. What does that mean? It's reaching more people, one heart at a time. He then told them uh, still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. That's the influence of God's kingdom meant to permeate society one heart at a time. We should all be about the influence of heaven and heaven's values impacting the earth. Now, we can't totally make that happen. It is a work of God. But as pilgrims, as strangers on the earth, as we seek God's face, as we go where God leads us and live out God's truth and character, his kingdom is at work in us and it tends to spill over and affect more lives. So back to Jacob. Genesis 46, verse 5 it says, Then Jacob left Beersheba, and Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport them. So Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt, taking with them their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in Canaan. God moved them to Egypt. Why? To preserve them, help them grow into a nation there in Egypt, but also to influence Egypt and the surrounding nations, to be a blessing to the nations of the world. This is, by the way, very similar to the pilgrims that came to America on the Mayflower. As I said, they'd been a church for years. And about 30 or 40 members of that church came across on the Mayflower. They also had children and some hired workers with them. And they're escaping religious persecution. They're seeking a new life where they could have liberty and make a living. And their story is really inspiring. Uh, and I encourage you to read, it's a free Kindle book, by the way, that I downloaded from Amazon and by William Bradford. It's on Plymouth Plantation. And, and it tells their story, it's his journal, and it's, it's so amazing. And they suffered a lot. But they were true Christians. They loved God deeply and they loved one another deeply. And as they came to America, they didn't know if they were all going to die. They knew that was a possibility. But they had a sense of God's call on their lives and they sensed that God was going to use them, but they had no idea to what degree. And they could not have made it happen. They were seekers of God. They were not seekers of significance. They're seeking God and seeking a life that they could have with God. Well, they were just a small group, but God made them hugely significant. They had a huge impact on the birth of America. They had a huge impact on the values that were written into our Constitution. And I'm about to blow your mind. How much influence did the pilgrims have? I, you know, if someone asked me a few weeks ago, how many living descendants of the pilgrims are there today? I wouldn't know. I'd think, I don't know. Is it in the hundreds? Are there any left? Or maybe thousands? I'm not kidding. You can look this up yourself and research it. I did. I thought it can't be true. An estimated 35 million people on the earth today are direct descendants of those pilgrims on the Mayflower. 10 million here in America and 25 million in other places of the world. At least nine U.S. presidents can trace their lineage right back to a member of that congregation on that ship. 
including President Taylor, President Grant, President Roosevelt, FDR, President Bush, the older one, and of course the younger one, and then President Obama, a descendant of the pilgrims, uh, I think through his mother's side. <laughs> God, what an amazing thing, this, this small little band barely surviving, half of them died the first winter. God used them to impact the world. And I do believe that God, God did ordain for this nation to be here. God did bring them over, those pilgrims, to have an influence. Now, that does not mean that I think America is perfect or ever was perfect. There's a battle right now over history. There's the 1619 Project trying to rewrite, in terms of a leftist ideology, what history really is. And then... President Trump talked about starting a 1776 commission to figure out how to develop patriotic curriculum for our schools. Uh, and so there's this battle over history. But I have a, a take on history that was pointed out to me once that really helped me. And that's the, the colony at Plymouth, the Pilgrims started, kind of represents something good. Most of them were godly people. The colony at Jamestown represents mostly uh, just capitalism, which is fine, but there was, ended up being a lot of greed, a lot of slavery, a lot of corruption. And you could see those two colonies, the first two colonies that, that lasted in America as seeds that were planted, just like the parable Jesus told of the wheat and the tares, were allowed to grow up together. And we have, since our earliest roots as a nation, some really godly influence based on biblical values. We also have some corrupt influence. And those things have grown up together. So people can point to history and say, look, America was a Christian nation, and they can quote. But we can also look back and see the sin and the wickedness all the way back to the earliest roots of this nation. They've grown up together. And I would suggest this that history taught in schools should be like the history taught in the Bible. That it's all shared, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I don't know why so many American Christians struggle to face the reality of the sins of the founding fathers of our nation. The founding fathers weren't perfect people any more than the patriarchs in the Bible were perfect, like Jacob and his family. The Bible is always very transparent about their sins and weaknesses. The writers of the Gospels were honest about their own failures. Why? Because the Bible is not the story of how great people are. It is the story of how great God is. And the story of America should be that same story. Let's not gloss over the sins of America's past and present, but let's point to God's mercy and grace in founding this nation Let's be thankful for the good of this nation, thankful for wise principles America was built on. Let's be thankful for freedom of religion, which the pilgrims were fleeing from persecution. And no, we should not allow certain ideologies, whether left-wing or extreme right-wing, uh, revise history to suit that ideology. We need to be people of the truth, and we, we need to look at Look at it fairly and accurately. But Christians should lead the way in pointing out the sins of our past. That is what godly people in Scripture did. People like Daniel, people like Nehemiah who prayed and said, God, forgive us. Forgive the sins of our nation. And I think of these pilgrims, and they weren't all perfect. And, and this picture of Jamestown and Plymouth, it's not a, a perfect picture because not everyone at Plymouth was godly and not everyone at Jamestown was wicked. It's just maybe a helpful picture, even though it's a generality. But these pilgrims, they were more interested in pursuing God and in God transforming them than winning arguments with others. They were the type of people who would constantly be praying, search us, O God. If there's anything off in us, set it right. That should be our prayer. And that is how God's kingdom comes on earth, as more and more people are doing that. 
and as we influence. And I, I spoke last week on the gospel, and the gospel needs to be on our lips as we influence, as God's kingdom spreads as well. But I'm going to go to the next point here, and that is not fearing death. As we are longing for our home, we should not be fearing death here. If we have heaven to look forward to, why should we fear death? There should be peace in us about the next life. I love in the song, In Christ Alone, the line that says, No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. We sang the song earlier, Give Me Jesus. It says, When I come to die, when I come to die, when I come to die, give me Jesus. Let's look at Jacob again. Verse 28 of Genesis 46. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, and that's a region, you know, that was part of Egypt, but separate from the main population of Egypt. This Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. What a great reunion. Israel said to Joseph, now I am ready to die since I have seen for myself that you are alive. That's always puzzled me. I think, hey, wouldn't he want to live a long time now enjoying company with his son? Um, I think there's certainly this sense that he's saying, I can die happy now. You're alive and I saw you again. But I do think there's more to it, perhaps. I think Jacob can now die having a hope for the future of his family and God's purposes. Jacob had really struggled in life. We saw how he had said, everything is against me. And I, I can imagine that he saw himself as a terrible failure. Here he was, the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham, the one who had inherited the blessing and the calling the one who was supposed to become a great nation and bless all peoples of the world. But what had happened? His family was severely dysfunctional. Jealousies, sibling rivalries. Simeon and Levi, two of his sons, had committed a massacre, a genocide of the Shechemites. His oldest son, Reuben, had an affair with his aunt, his brother's mother. Two of Judah's sons, were through his daughter-in-law who had posed as a prostitute. The brothers had all hated Joseph, and now Jacob believed, had believed that, Jacob was, or that Joseph was dead. No wonder Jacob thought everything was against him. And he probably fretted about leaving this earth and leaving behind a messed up legacy. But when he found out that Joseph was alive, what a reminder that God was still in control. Not only that Joseph was alive, but God had done a miracle and raised him up to second in command of all of Egypt. And it says that Jacob's spirit was revived. And I have this sense that he realized, I can move on now. God has the next generation under control. His plans, his promises are still intact. Sometimes we can fret about the state of the world, can ask who will replace the great, the great saints among us who are passing away to the next life. Is the younger generation going in the right direction? Have I done enough? But there are Josephs we don't know about in the younger generation that God has put in place or is putting in place. Just like Elijah felt depressed and hopeless. He thought he was the only one left who really served God. And God showed him there was a remnant of 7,000 others like him. And God showed him that there's a young man named Elisha that would become the next prophet after Elijah. So we should have a perspective that God's got it in control and we should not be afraid of death because we're going to a great place because God, he has good plans and he, those will go forward without us. But we should also be willing to stay and do more work for as long as God wants us to be here. And that was Paul's perspective. Philippians 1.21. He says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. He had a longing for home. 
And he says, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. He says, hey, my work isn't done. I'm going to stay alive longer, I think. And so that's a great balanced perspective that Paul gives for us there. I have one more point about longing for home, and it's living as foreigners. What it is to live as foreigners here on the earth. When I was in college, I didn't know where home was because the home I grew up in, in the Pomona Chino area, uh, as I started college in the same area in Claremont, my family moved to Northern California. So I had always, for most of my life, lived in Southern California. Right as I started college, they left. Most people leave home to go to college and they always have a home to come back to. But when I started college, my parents left. And I didn't know where home was. Was it Southern California or was it Northern California where my family was? There was also a question of where home was for me spiritually. I was faced with a choice. Would I belong to the world or to God's kingdom? And I almost belonged to the world, but by the grace of God, he saved me. And that made me a foreigner in this world and on that college campus and on the water polo team I was on. And I did feel foreign. And there's a sense in which we will never fit in fully here on earth. And we see that in this story, Genesis 46, 31. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were living in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds. They tend livestock and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, what is your occupation? You should answer Your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Detestable. So the, the Israelites would be despised for being shepherds. And I would say that it was good that they were despised in that sense and were separated from Egypt because I believe as they grew into a nation that kept them pure. If they had been in mixed in with the Egyptian population, they would have probably intermarried a lot and, and been influenced by Egyptian culture and religion. But God kept them separate to himself even, even as they were in Egypt, protected from the famine. God has a purpose, even when we are being despised, even when we're being hated. Jesus said this in Matthew 24, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. I always wonder, how could that be? Christians are to be loving people. Why would they be hated? And yeah, I've made the mistake recently of getting into some debates with atheists on Facebook. And, and I thought, I'm going to share my testimony. I'm going to share love. And I found out, no, they hate me. <laughs> They're very angry um, at Christians. And I believe some of that Christians have probably brought upon themselves in our country. And we, we have to really be thoughtful about how to best engage our culture. But then some of it is, some people are just God haters. They, they have a resentment toward God. And, and when they realize that you are sharing God with them, they hate you too. Jesus said that if they hate you, remember they hated him first. And so there should be a separateness from this world, even as we're here, even if we're despised by certain people, and obviously it's not everyone, but it's normal. We should remember that that is normal, and then we should remember that there should be the separateness, and not to say that we should disconnect from unbelieving family or friends, but here's what it says in 1 Peter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. You're in a foreign land. It doesn't have the values of heaven. And you're being tempted as a foreigner, as an exile. It, it, abstain. Stay away. Say no to those sinful desires which war against your soul. And then it says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. 
end time essential, (laughs) waiting for him to visit us. We realize this is not our home. We're going to live differently than the world lives here. We're going to cut off the habits and customs of this world that are not part of God's culture. And then we realize that as we are doing all this, God allows trials for us. We go through them. This is the, we're, we're about to wrap it up. Genesis 47, verse 7. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. 130 is long for nowadays, but back then, his, his father and grandfather lived longer. But he said it was a pilgrimage. What did he mean by that? He was a wanderer. He was a foreigner. He's looking ahead to the heavenly country. But he said that his years had been difficult. And God allows us to go through tough times. But that should remind us that it is just a pilgrimage. This is not our true home. We are just passing through. And that brings us all the way back to our first point. If we, we'll review those points here. Looking forward to heaven. Whatever we go through here, we can endure it because we know it will before long be over. And we have a home in heaven. In the meantime, we're loving God's presence wherever we are. We're trying to bring heaven to earth, be a good influence. We're not fearing death. And we're living as strangers, separateness from the world. And when we do all of that, God's going to do great things, just like he did with those pilgrims who had no idea what was going to happen. We're going to sing a song to close here. And it's a perfect song. It's based on Psalm 84, verse 10. I want to read that for you here. Better is one day in your courts, God, than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Some of the tents of the wicked are are pretty nice. This guy says, I'll just be a doorkeeper in God's house. That's my home where God is. I want to invite you to go before the Lord as we sing this song and say, God, where you are, that's my home. I want to be wherever you are. Let's respond by singing this song together. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, for my soul and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied within your presence. Sing beneath the shadow. One thing I ask and I
Yes, Lord, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. We want to be where you are. And Lord, we pray today that you would help us have a perspective that we are strangers here, but, but we are longing for our true home. We, our roots are not here, but in heaven with you. Thank you that in the meantime, you are with us. You are carrying us. You are using us. We thank you for the heritage of this nation, the good parts. And we pray that we would follow in those footsteps, Lord. I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you, anyone listening, that they would experience your spirit opening their hearts. That just like a flower in the presence of the sun starts to open up, that their heart would open up before you and they would be able to turn in faith to you and say, Lord, save me. Lord, come into my life. And if that is you, I just encourage you to do that right now. Respond to the Lord. But for now, we love you. God bless you. And may his presence be with you in a powerful way as you go. And we will see you next time. God bless.